It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. With the Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. for the World of Martial Arts Television. It is mm-hmm. the one and only Mark Ormerod. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. If you had to you had to describe basically you as a person right now, what you do for a living, I'm going to put you on the spot. What would you say? Do you know what, right? People ask me this all the time. They say, oh, you know, what are you up to now? What do you do? And I still don't know how to encompass all of the things that I do under one banner if that makes sense both yeah, exactly personally and professionally it's just a massive hodgepodge mixed pot of awesomeness and randomness that i love every day uh, we've already got our connection through brazilian jiu-jitsu and as you know uh the, the, the mad thing about brazilian jiu-jitsu is like if there is supposedly that five stages of separation between everybody on the planet in mm-hmm. brazilian jiu-jitsu i think it's about two because yeah. that's how it normally works. Because it really, it it just crystallizes very, very quickly. But some of the guys, when I mentioned that I was interviewing you, like I said, I mentioned Bradley Osteema, and he was like, "Mark's amazing." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I've, I, I have heard that." And then uh, we have got a good mutual friend. I've got to give him a shout out to him, um, which is uh, Nigel Davison, Nigel Semperna yeah, Davison. Yeah. yeah. So Nigel yeah. was exactly the same. And you actually first came on my radar, not because of jujitsu. I'm always looking for inspirational stuff. You were the most motivational person that I saw was just turned around and just went, I am who I am. And the thing that got me that I really liked was because normally ask, people ask you about your beginning, right? Mm-hmm. But what, what I want to ask you about is one of the last things that you did in one of your, uh, one of your clips where you turned around and said that everything has led to where you are now. And mm-hmm. how amazing and awesome your life was. And I was already inspired. And then that was literally the last line that you brought into it. So we're going to, mm-hmm. if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to, we're going to reverse engineer like an interview because okay. of where you are now mm-hmm. and how you've got there. How, how did you get there? Like, yeah, I mean, you know, just in your mindset. I know that I hope this makes sense to you because it does kind to of. me. Yeah, a good. Well, the thing is, it's the old jujitsu brain now. You see, what I'm doing is, <laughs> I've, I, what it is, is I've got the submission and I'm working my way back. Got you. Yeah. High five and the fist bump. That's how I'm doing it. So where you are now? Yeah. How, you know, how have you got here? It has taken a a change in personality and mindset. Absolutely. It's taken numerous changes in my professional and social circles. It's taken, uh, what's, are we allowed to curse on here? Go ahead. Okay. It's taken a shitload of reading and personal development and attending of seminars and courses. And I would say the, the key to it all has been 1% incremental changes applied with consistency over time that in all areas of my life, health, family, fitness, finances, careers, jujitsu, whatever it is, I try to make small incremental changes, which are enjoyable, which I can apply with consistency. I can do for a long, long time. And those small incremental changes add up 
and then they are what have brought me from where I was back then to where it is that I am now, both mentally, physically, and dare I say it, spiritually. Yeah. Well, you see, I'm I'm so glad I'm so glad that you've encompassed that because for me that was the elephant in the room. Because when I was thinking about how to interview you, normally you start at the beginning and you get this. It's very easy to create narrative. So you know, and everything that I've seen where you've been interviewed. It always dwells on first of all, uh, you know, Afghan. Well, joining mm-hmm. the Marines, right? Mm-hmm. And anybody who knows anything about it, like to join the Royal Marines Commander, that's it's as good as it gets. There's no, mm-hmm. no yeah, just the training period alone, and some of the stuff that you said. As I said, this will make me sound like a proper fanboy, but you said you were saying when that niggling doubt comes in your mind, you're about forty percent depleted physically. Yeah. But the bit that tells you to quit, you're 40%. You've got another 60%. And what, what I really liked was everything that I listened to that you came out with, it was um, it goes against everything that motivational speakers talk about because motivational speakers want that road to Damascus moment. They want that paradigm shift. What they don't want to tell people is that this is going to be an ongoing experience for a decade, maybe longer. And there's more days where you're not going to improve than not uh, than you are going to improve. But it was really funny that you, the, what you said because um, it's going to lead me into now how how you got into jujitsu and why jujitsu is so important to you. Mm-hmm. Because now this is again this is and this isn't buttering you up. You know I'm a decent brown belt of Brazilian jujitsu. I'm a 54 year old man. I get this shit kicked out of me by guys who have trained for six, seven months. They've mm-hmm. just watched loads of YouTube and they just naturally, they've got it. And with me, I can always say I'm Irish and Catholic and a middle child, right? So I embrace this like mm-hmm. masochistic tendencies that I've got. But with you, you went into jujitsu with the limitations that you've got, mm-hmm. picking the hardest sport. And I don't care what anyone says. I'll take the Pepsi challenge with anyone. Jiu-jitsu is it's the sustained beatings. Thai boxing is great. People don't stay at Thai boxing until they're 70. Right. Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they, they do. So with where you were saying about the incremental changes, how did you get into Brazilian jiu-jitsu? So prior to me being injured, uh, from about the age of 13 through to 24 when I was injured, I, I trained and competed as an amateur kickboxer, uh, Muay Thai fighter, and a boxer. So I had a a background in martial arts. And when I lost my legs and my arm, one of the most devastating thoughts for me was that martial arts was out of my life forever. And and not just the competitive side at all. It was, you know, I really loved the honour, the integrity, the discipline, the respect, and, and all that kind of stuff that you carry out of a dojo or an academy into your life. And I thought it had gone forever. And I was approached after I was injured by a gentleman from various different disciplines. I think there was Taekwondo and and Karate, and uh, maybe one other, who told me they could get me to a black belt standard. And I kind of knew that they couldn't. You know, I don't have legs, so I do I kick. You know, with karate, I can't do kata because I'm limited. So I assumed that if I could do that, then it would have been based on sympathy and pity. And I wouldn't have actually been hitting the standards required to go through the grading system. Now, I had, like a lot of kids, I think, dabbled with different things when when I was growing up. So I tried Aikido, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, taekwondo and all these different martial art disciplines and one day when i was in royal marines headquarters in the sergeant's mess uh, a gentleman approached me he was a serving color sergeant physical training instructor and he was the head of royal marines unarmed combat at the time and a purple belt in jiu-jitsu and he said he he introduced himself that way and said would you like to come down and train with me now, I didn't know what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was. This is maybe, I think, 2016, 17. I didn't know what it was. 
in my mind, I thought of Japanese jiu-jitsu, which what I remembered was lots of wrist locks, rubber knives, throwing people in like judo <laughs> throws and rolling over people. And I thought, here we go again. There's another guy trying to get me into a martial art that I can't progress through based on hard work. So I went down there and he explained it to me. He said, right, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a ground-based grappling system. And I, I take my prosthetic legs off to do it. So I'm sat on the floor and I'm thinking, perfect. I'm already halfway there because I'm sat on my ass. So I've got yeah. half of this covered. Now teach me the other half. And he explained it's, you know, you're trying to submit people, to choke people, to, to do whatever. And he didn't go too much into detail, um, but just basically gave me the concepts and the oversight of it all. And then whipped my ass for the next hour. Yeah. And by the time we had finished, and I... You know, go back to what I said earlier. I thought this is they've been taken out of my life forever. And I mentioned about the discipline and everything, but that feeling of being in a fight and the adrenaline and the heart racing and the lungs burning, I thought that was gone too. But by the end of that hour, you know, I had some cuts on my face and my joint, my arms were hurting. And, and I was like, wow, I've got it back. This is it. And I was just, it was just like, ping, I need to pursue this. Then, the second session we did was was a lot more slow. We, we slowed the pace down and we started talking about, you know, hierarchy, positional hierarchy, the aim of it, position over submission. He started telling me all these things. And we started working through some of the basics, but seeing how I could adapt them as a man with only one arm. Yeah. So we looked at we looked at things like arm bars and a, and a couple of chokes and, um, you know, very, very basic stuff. But then I sat there and I thought, I can legitimately do this. You know, I can, if I can get into these positions, I can somehow lock on these submissions and these chokes and actually win fights with people. So we started training and it was rough. You know what it's like? like the first six months was just miserable. Just blokes yeah. beating the shit out of me. I got, I, I remember one day in particular, um, the overseeing professor at the time, Jimmy Johnson, was from Bournemouth. He was a black belt. I know Jimmy very well. Right. So he came he down with Nathan, pal. Nathan, yeah. his son, who at the time was 15, right? Yeah. I knew nothing about either of them. So I rode with Jimmy. I rode with some of the lads and I, and I finished off rolling with Nathan. And he pulled me into his guard. And all I can remember was that I got told, if someone pulls you into their guard, Put your arm on the chest, you know, don't completely lock it out, but just kind of stiff arm him and it will stop him sitting up, grabbing you, pulling you clip. So I put my arm down, I'm like, this kid's never going to get anywhere near me. And then some people would like clear the arm and or, or just jerk their body up. He like stared me in the eyes at the Terminator and just like, just just, just sit up. And I'm like, I can't push him down. He's like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I just sit like, and I was like, holy shit. And then, I felt actually pretty terrible after that. I'm like a 15-year-old has just kicked my ass. I then found out it was Jimmy's son. He's been doing it since he came out of the womb. He was a Cage Warriors champion. So I'm like, okay, yeah. cool. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, you but that. It, it was very humbling. Very, very humbling. And then we just worked from there. And, you know, trained more and more and more, played with more and more different things, started having some success with stuff, realized there was some stuff I had to completely just disregard, you know, spider guard, X guard, yeah, that kind of stuff in the beginning, anyway, and just work on the basics and uh, figure my way around stuff. And then I guess uh, you know I stuck it out. I stuck it out. I eventually got my blue belt, which is great. I never got into it to compete. I, I literally got into it because I loved the way it made me feel. I love that feeling of incremental progression and achieving something based on hard work. And I love the community of people yeah. that I trained with. Uh, so I was competing was never on my radar. Uh, my, my life's like super busy too with, uh, with work and three kids and a wife, yeah. I think. Um, so I was happy just to turn up, train and eventually progress uh, through the rank structure. Uh, I did actually end up competing last year. Yeah, uh, I saw because... it. Amazing, amazing fight, bro. I saw it because it ended up on YouTube. Uh, it was all. Oh, did it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it went on to Facebook first, and then it came up. And then, like, because I had a few mates of mine, they were going, "Did you see this guy?" And I went, "Mate, he's a killer. He's a killer." But it was. What? How did it feel to get get back out there and compete? It was horrible, mate. I'm not going to lie yeah? to you. 
I, <clears throat> this is, it's all my own fault. I didn't research how to compete. So like how to score points. I didn't research what the rules were. I didn't, in my mind, for some reason, and it, this is just me, like, I just thought, okay, I turn up there and I try and submit somebody and I try not to get submitted. And I, I didn't think of any of the uh, other details of it. Um, so I turned up and they, and obviously in, in the, the power world, it's a very small pool of people. And there are about four or five of us. And when I got there, I was a blue belt at the time, two stripes. They said, you can either go with the white belts or you can step up and go with the brown belts. And so I sat there and I thought, well, the whole point of this is to challenge yourself, right? You know, and I'm not, I'm not at, for a second saying I would have just gone in and stormed the white belt. I probably, he could have probably beat me. But I just thought, I want to step up and, and see what kind of level this is at and, and where I stand. So I stepped up to the brown belt category. We were roughly a similar weight, 60 to 65 kilos. And uh, slapped hand, fist bump. And I just, it just felt like I was in a washing machine. Like I, I just, in all my training, it had been very like slap hands, fist bump. Okay, let's go. Like flow. Yeah. And, and, you know, you get a bit, you'd, you'd go a bit mad every once in a while. But this from the second we went, boom, this, this guy was on me. And I'm like, and I, I, feel, I felt very comfortable in a lot of vulnerable positions. So I was, I was just, this guy's taking my back and I'm like, cool, I'm safe here. He can't tap me. He only had one hand as well. I know there's guys with two hands that couldn't submit me from here. I know how to survive. I'll gradually work my way out. Not even thinking, you just give away points. And it was lit, it was about four minutes in when my jacket came off. The referee separated us. He put my jacket back on. I looked at the clock because I was gassing. I'm like, how long have we got left? And then I'm like, 12 nil. Shit, points. What the hell? Yeah. And then I'm like, I don't even know how to score points because no one's ever told me. <laughs> so I was just like, I've got to try and submit this guy. So, and I just didn't. I couldn't. He was too fast, too good um to experience so I, I think i lost 14 nil but i learned so much more from losing that than i think i would have won from winning that well it's very interesting you said that because there's two uh, two things i won the british open at a white belt right so i've been doing martial arts for years and it's that whole thing nowhere near on your scale but i'm there quite well known in martial arts and i'll start brazilian jiu-jitsu and i went in there and i remember my ego saying if i don't go in there and beat people they're going to go, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And again, you know what it's like? I'm pretty good at Muay Thai, pretty good at boxing. Mm. But they go, yeah, but he's pretty shit at Jiu Jitsu. He's pretty shit at martial arts. He got beaten by someone. And right. I was there and I didn't do the same thing because I've always been the same. Take down, smash pass, grab the arm. Like, yeah. But uh, yeah, my, my, my Instagram handle is Kimura, uh, Kimura Delivery System. So give me an arm. I'll bend it every single time. So I'm there. And as I'm like the first fight I had, I lost. But luckily enough, I went back and fought the guy again, beat him. So that was the final. It was a round robin. And the, the guys were shouting at me because I took him down. But because I took him down, I didn't spend my time, didn't get the knee on belly, didn't rack up the points, lie on the guy. And, and I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, I'm, you know, I'm master of samurai here. You know what I mean? Mm. I go to kill people. And then it was like, no. But like as I said, don't be too hard on yourself because a really good friend of mine, Wayne Lakin, he's an Olympic judoka. He's unreal. He started jiu-jitsu with me and I had to run through two weeks ago with him, the point scoring system. And he went, yeah, but why would I do any of that? And I went, it's don't hate the player. I hate the game, yeah. bro. It's the game. So you, as you were saying, like it, it's funny as you said it, because in some of my research, when you were, especially when you were in the Invictus games, when you were competing at that, it seems like you went the completely other way and got obsessional and doing five days a week. And put all the time into it. So what what went from like Mark Ormrod, the guy who's putting all the time in, five a.m. every morning, then just going, it, was it the Brazilian jiu-jitsu mentality that went, you know what, screw it, I'll turn up and have a go? Is that is that what kicked in, or well, what was you it? Say that, but at the very first Invictus Games, it was exactly the same. I, I turned up, I didn't know the rules, I didn't learn any of the strategies. You know, I'm doing things like rowing. I'm like strategy for rowing i go backwards and forwards for four minutes it's not that difficult but there's a lot more to it than that and again that that's why at the first one i didn't have the success that i had at the second so after the first one i went back spoke to my coaches i'm like listen i was i was a dick like just tell me how i'm supposed to do this tell me the strategy because i don't know if you ever tried doing four minutes in a rowing machine at max 10 you, wow. you, it's 
it's mate as soon as you hit like two two and a half minutes you tank and it's impossible to recover like your brain's like go 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 your body's like nope so i like this strategy you know where you just you cruise for like two to two and a half minutes and as you've got to be at it in your mind on the little screen where the boats are say it's okay it's fine everyone else is going to start gassing in a minute and then that's when you pick it up blah, 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 blah. and then i learned to control my emotions and that and that's when i went the second time i came back and did a lot better so that's what I'm hoping to do with Jits. I got a fight on Wednesday. Wednesday, where? Yeah, I ordered a shot at the Army Championships. Oh, wicked man! Well, just yeah. just one fight. I don't know. Um, they found a uh, purple belt, sixty-five kilos, I think. Um, well, it's was, it was, it was funny. It's funny you were saying, you, yeah, funny you talking about competing because I, I was I rang a friend of mine earlier, Mark Tucker. Good mate of Sam Sheriff's ex Royal Marine Commando. He started up the Marine Brazilian Jiu Jitsu team back in the day, sort of before Reorg. And when I mentioned you, he said, "He goes, Mick, guy's got skills, man." And I was like, mm. I, have, "I have no doubt about that." And like, well, I mentioned Reorg for a for a reason because um, I've always maintained that martial arts is a vehicle for personal development. If you get away all of the the woo-woo bit that is a very hard sell, uh, especially for men, because what you want to do is you just want to turn around. I say this all the time. I bring kids in. My kids who train me, I always say to the parents, you give me your kid for six months and I'll give you back a badass. But I'll give you a badass mm. who says please and thank you, right? Mm. And for me, it's what's going on in here, but through the crucible of the change and the, you know, just embracing the primal aspect but with Brazilian jiu-jitsu, there's that mad paradox where you have to be a killer. But it's like, you know, it's a Roger Gracie line, isn't it? Fire in the belly, mm. ice in the brain, yeah? So why do you think, especially, I know that Reorg are, are able to, they're able to focus in on a group that really need it. But why do you think that jiu-jitsu in particular has just managed to get so many ex-military guys to embrace jujitsu, not just getting on the map, but the whole aspect that comes with it. Yeah, why do you think that I, is? I think there's a crossover in values. So hard work is one of them, discipline, respect, humor in the face of adversity. That's one of the Royal Marines values and you definitely need that in jujitsu. Yeah. I think, like I said earlier, the community, you know, it's, it's close knit, like the military community. You know, and, and in the military, so, so what the reason this is, is my opinion, but like in the military, the reason you form such strong bonds and friendships with people is because you all start on day one and you go through the same shit and then you come out at the end and this is a basic training. And then you've all done the same thing. You've reached the same standards to get your Green Beret, your Marine Beret, whatever it is, your wings, anything like that. And then you go on to tours and operations and you understand what that takes to get through that. and you know, tragically, you might see friends killed or, or hurt. So you have that in common. And in jiu-jitsu, it's similar that you all start on day one, getting the shit kicked out of you by a 15-year-old, and you've got to meet his standards to go blue, purple, brown, black, and you're in adversity together all the time. And you're constantly learning together and you're growing together on the mat and off the mat. And, you yeah. know, the social aspect of it, like I say, sharing a coffee or an acai bowl or whatever, whatever it is that you want. <laughs> Um, and just talking about jujitsu, and it's yeah. funny. I was watching a, a video. I forgot the guy's name. He does the is it BJJ Brotherhood? Maybe does these instructional videos. But he said he was uh, on a train in Tokyo, and he's got the cauliflower right. And he he looks yes. down the train. He sees this other guy with cauliflower. He points at it and goes, just nods at him. And they, they just, yeah, didn't even uh, speak. They just yeah. walked away and didn't even speak. But yeah, I'm just that, like that's uh, it. I think that was a uh, Nick Gregoridis, yeah? Yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Nick, yeah Nick, Nick, again, this is the thing. Uh, you know, uh, you hit on something there. It's that, sh it's that shared work ethic. Nothing gets given to you. That, mm -hmm. yeah, and you and you know yourself. The minute you see, like, what I've found with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is, uh, once, uh, and yeah, Joe Rogan famously has said, once you're a purple belt, you're a black belt, you just haven't got the time in yet. Because, like, you've, you've, formulated pretty much your basic game and when the shit hits the fan you'll always go back to your basic game you'll expand out over it but what i've found with, with bjj is there's 
we meet loads of guys they're full of bs but as I, like, I come out with it all the time where it's like you have to have an authentic relationship with most of the guys that you train with because you know their ball sack is like an inch away from your nose for sometimes four or five minutes in a row and yep. uh, and it's like and i'm not really into that either you know what i mean <laughs> and, and thank god it's not nokia you know but uh, you, you understand what i mean it's that whole yeah. thing where you go you can't you can't buy it you know i've 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 seen it firsthand where I've been on the mat and yeah, here's a great example. Um, yeah. Uh, I know he's a good friend of yours. It's like, Dan, it's like Tom Hardy, right? So Tom Hardy mm -hmm. turns up to a comp. He's there. Everyone's like everyone in mainstream media are going, I can't believe it. You had time for everybody. And you go, uh, yeah. Mm. yeah, of course he had because everybody else, like my mate kicked him in the head. In the semi-final, oh, yeah, I yeah saw big that. Polish I saw guy. That. Yeah, you yeah. saw it, right? And mm -hmm. then I said, "What happened?" He goes, "It's a bit like Pearl Harbor, man." And I said, "What happened?" He goes, "You know that line where it goes?" Uh, he goes, "I think I, I, I think I got him." And he went, "No, no, I just woke up a sleeping giant." You know what I mean? Because <laughs> Hardy went and smashed him, and that's yeah. a, that's a Hollywood superstar. He's good, man. But when, but but when you want, oh man, mm -hmm. is he good? That guy, mm -hmm. he's something else. Just mentioned Tom Hardy, right? And. Uh, like I've had a few moments where I've been on the mat and I'm looking at a guy and I'm like, recognize him. And then he's tearing through everyone. And it was Dan Rogers and it was Guy Ritchie. Oh, okay. And you know, you only, you only, yeah, so guy, you know, guy is legit. You know, he is yeah. a killer. And you're looking at it and you're like, I only see him on TV where he's being a bit of a tough and stuff. And then, yeah, wearing a tweed and everything. And then obviously seeing him in Joe Rogan. Uh, but then you realize he's legitimately good. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've, I know you've rolled with Tom. What what yeah, is he as good as everyone tells me? Yeah, he's very strong, and he's got yeah. he's got the mind for it. He's so clever. Yeah. Like when you get into deep conversations with him, and I don't know what whether, what you call it is it maybe an analytical mind where he can break things down and see how it's yeah. supposed to be. And yeah, he's very good, very good. Yeah, it's like it it was really it was really funny because. As I said, he, he fought my mate Damien. I've got to give a shout out to Damien because Damien, he's, uh, again, give you an idea how just how wild the BJJ world is, right? Damien is a lorry driver who delivers eggs. So he's a Polish okay. guy, typical Polish guy, must get up at like half three in the morning, does his shift. Then he comes training, turns up to the gym with like five dozen eggs. And nice. you're like, how random is this? But this is for all the other guys. And then... Uh, he always says that he's always the bridesmaid, never the bride, because he's getting silver all the time. Now he's getting some gold, good blue belt, big, long, rangy guy, right? Gets back to Canuck, and he's like, he can't work out why people are dead interested in him. And what it is, is they literally are only interested in his right foot, because it's his right foot that went into Tom Hardy's head when he went for the gutter <laughs> pass. And I was like, right. dude, they're not even interested in you, mate. They're only interested in Doing your the foot. foot. Yeah, that, that was it. But you know when you were talking about the you were talking about the analytical thing, I was I've been watching a lot of your lot of your stuff anyway, because like again, Will 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 back me up this. Will Womo is doing the producing here. My wife is not interested in some of the guys. Like my kids are really into it. They're grown men, but they're in they're into MMA. MMA. So when I said that I was interviewing Demetrius Johnson, they're impressed. When it's nice. Dan Hardy, they're impressed. When it's mm -hmm. Bisping, they're impressed. When I turned around and told my wife, because you came on the TV when you were doing the swimming recently, okay. and I said to my wife, I said, he's a pub belt jiu-jitsu. And she went, and then when I told her I was interviewing you today, then she was impressed. And she's never no, impressed sweet. at all. So it's one of those, <laughs> right? Nice. So, so the, the, the thing that got me when I was looking at your, your motivational stuff, we just mentioned the swimming, right? Mm. But if you don't mind, you in one of your interviews, it really got me. And I'd like, to hear it in your words. If, if nothing else, out of all of the stories, as I said, normally when there's anything about you like on YouTube, people focus on Afghanistan. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna mm. like try and wash over that. But with me, it was everything that you said after it, you know? And it was the point where you you, you if you don't mind, the story is the story about the guy who comes in and he's like the guru of amputees in the UK and you're about three and a half weeks into your recovery and mm -hmm. the story like, I don't know if Will's heard this but for the guys who are watching this for me 
this is the most inspirational thing when I've seen where you are now. Mm -hmm. like, but when you tell the story, you're just like, wow, dude, that's a movie. Right. That bit mm. there. So if you don't mind explaining the three and a half weeks into the recovery and then go from there, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, you know, I was lying in a hospital bed, Celioc in Birmingham, tubes up my nose, all these vacuum pumps on my legs, pulling all this gunk out for to stop me getting infected. I've got a big scar on my hand, the only hand I've got left where I had a big hole in the middle of it where shrapnel had tore open so I could only use two fingers. 24 years old, I've just gone from six foot two, 16 stone, to three foot five, and eight stone, 11, I think. So I'm trying to be positive. And then this doctor walked in three and a half weeks post-explosion. And very matter-of-factly, as he introduced himself, told me that I had no chance of ever walking again. And that in his 33 years experience, he had never met anybody missing one leg above the knee that had any success with prosthetics because they were too painful, they were too hard to use, and they took too much energy. So most people just put them in the cupboard and got in a wheelchair. And then he left. So as you can imagine, you know, it wasn't really what I wanted to hear at that point in my recovery. And that sent me on a bit of a spiral, a bit of a downhill spiral, stopped taking phone calls, stopped speaking to visitors, uh, got very angry and, and bitter, I think, with the world and with my situation and just couldn't see a, a future for myself. So, and I'm, I'm very honest when I tell people this, I contemplated suicide and I'm, I'm, please, I don't say suicide I don't talk about anything to do with suicide lightly or, or with with any sort of humor but it was like three o'clock in the morning and I had to have a little laugh to myself when I sat there feeling pissed off and I just thought I can't even cut my own wrists what a useless twat and I had a little giggle about that and then just like kind of shook it off it took about four or five days and then I was like right okay let's go let's uh you know excuse my French but fuck this doctor you know, he doesn't know me. He doesn't know my mindset. He doesn't know my support system. He doesn't know what I'm about. So if there is a way, we'll find it and then we'll go and do it. And that's what we did. Well, you see, this is the thing, right? So again, um, I'm always very wary. I'm very wary of motivational speakers and very wary of guru type for individuals, especially if they say they're a guru. So yeah, it's like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Any guy who calls himself a professor, I already know, yeah. guess what? You don't yeah. deserve that. Everyone else will call you a professor. You don't yeah. do it. And in a lot of stuff that I've watched with you before, you've always said that you, you get motivated by seeing people do stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if you don't mind, if you can mention this gentleman in America, Cameron, and then, yeah. like, as I said, the, the, that part of the story that you just said there, where you've come to the realization, that motivated me. But this next part, when you go to America, and there is a few, there's a few bits where there's, uh, if you don't mind me saying, there's some quite unflattering video footage of you, where mm -hmm. it's where you're just put on on the spot. So if you don't mm -hmm. mind, how did you find Cameron first, and then explain that process if you don't mind? So in Within that first six weeks in hospital, after this doctor had visited, I got a laptop brought in and I started doing research because I couldn't do anything else except sit there watching DVDs or, or surfing the internet. So I thought, and, and I, I've known this for a long time, like probably since I was a kid, that if I want to achieve something or try and be the best at something, the easiest way for me to do that is to find someone that's already achieved it and just make them my mentor, whether they want to or not. I can still sit in the background and watch what they do and, and figure stuff out by listening to what they say. But the best way is to say, listen, can you help me? I need to, I love what you do. I think it's great. I want to achieve something similar. Can you help? So I found Cameron online and he had been hit by a train in 2002 when he was 15, lost both his legs and his right arm, slightly higher than mine. And I, I couldn't believe what I saw. When I had this doctor telling me, you've got zero chance of walking, 
This guy was like, it didn't, you didn't even know he had prosthetics on. It was just so effortless for him. And he wasn't just out there walking. You know, he never used a wheelchair. He, he's from California. So he, he was a surfer and he still surfed in the ocean, still swam, still ran the triathlons and all this stuff. He was, he was a motivational speaker, uh, going to schools. He didn't have carers like I had at the time. He didn't have any of this disabled stuff that I had. He was just out there living his life. And I'm like, well, if this guy's achieved it, if I just replicate his physical and mental process as closely as I can, then why can't I do the same? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I emailed him, introduced myself. He emailed me back within that week. I spoke to his team, the guys that make his legs, his arms, do all the programming and train him. And then they all invited me out to America to meet Cameron and to train with them and uh, see if I could take what at the time I think was six years of their successes and failures and distill it down into three weeks. So I asked the the military, can I go over? They said no. I spent a good seven to 10 days agonizing over whether I should just go or not. Because, you know, I'm in the military, you got to do what you're told. And in the end, after lots of two, three, four a.m. conversations with my wife, I was like, right, okay, listen, in, in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, none of these officers or any of these people in the military are going to be in my life. And if I don't go and I give up this opportunity to meet this guy and learn from his team and, and himself, then I could potentially regret this. So, yeah, I'll probably come back, you know, get my wrist slapped, get get charged or whatever it is and disciplined, fine, whatever, I'll take it. I'll go over there, see what I can learn, and then whatever happens, good or bad, I'll come back and pick up the pieces when I get home. So 9th of June 2009, got in my car, I went AWOL in the military, uh, <laughs> drove, drove to America, flew out to meet Cameron and his team, and went through an intensive three-week training program of, like you said, some very unflattering footage. You know, I was I was fat and overweight, it's falling over all the time, covered in cuts and bruises. Um, but I knew it was it was short term pain for long term gain. And 9th of June two thousand nine was the last time I used a wheelchair. Well, you see, th this is the thing, right? You, you you're selling yourself short here because in a few of your interviews, you've mentioned about how terrified you were because there's a few caveats that they put in place that mm -hmm. you were going over there. So what did they say? Yeah, you know, just for the guys who are watching. What yeah, part of the deal going over there was what weren't you allowed to do? So I couldn't take a wheelchair with me, which I thought was impossible because at the time I could only wear prosthetics for two or three hours a day. Um and they wanted me to go like three weeks without a chair. So that and I don't mind admitting this, that terrified me. I wasn't allowed to bring my wife or any carers with me. And they were basically running around doing everything for me at the time. And I couldn't, I had to bring the the minimal amount of equipment. So I couldn't like have all these bags of all this, you know, disabled stuff in it to help me out. It was literally me, some prosthetics, some shorts and t-shirts and a wash bag. Um, wow. And I, and I did think about backing out because it, it, it terrified me. I thought I can't, there's no way I can't even, you know, drive to the airport without being in agony, let alone fly to the other side of the world, navigate airports, change planes, spend three weeks with strangers when I don't even know if they actually can help me or not. But in the end, I was just like, you know what? Well, it's going to, it's going to suck, but I'm going to just give it a go anyway and see what happens. And if I learn anything, then brilliant. If I don't, fine, we'll pick up where we left off. Well, you see, this is this is the thing. I rem like, as I said, in a few of the interviews you had, you you mentioned the fact that one of your driving motivations were you were going to stand up when you were getting the medal. And mm -hmm. it was like, I'm going to be there. And like that was the one that got me because it was like you mentioned, I've, and I've, I've heard this quite a few times, where with a triple amputee, the amount of energy it takes to do just ordinary mundane chores, it's mm -hmm. like 300 to 400% more effort. I think that was that's what I've heard. Um, really? Wow. 300 to 500%. Right. And then how, lo how long, 
you already knew how long you'd have to be on the parade on the parade ground for how many mm -hmm. how long were you there for 45 minutes and how long had you spent standing up before then four minutes if that you, you see like as i said this was the thing it's like i i've spoken to quite a few people about this and every single one of them they were like when you interview me, you, that would be the first time you ever tongue-tied with someone. And I'm like, because what I'll do now is I'll go, uh, get to about 38 minutes, I got back to being Mick Tully. Because at the start of it, I can't, because I've met loads of really inspirational characters, right? But most of the time, it's not as demonstrative, they're not as demonstratively impressed. Like, just by being you, mm -hmm. that, that yeah, yeah, that's what gets me. It's like, how, how can you be like that, right? So... What my, my 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 take is now is when you've come, when you've gone over you've seen Cameron and come back, how did you make the transition like which is always difficult to Civvy Street, and then what did you think you were going to do you know like married man kids, how are you going to pay the bills so if you don't mind explaining that for us please. <laughs> so th it, this is a funny story, so I didn't want to leave the military. Right, that was all I knew. I loved the, the lads and you know all the adventures and, and the banter and everything, but I had no choice. Right, I could have stayed on, but I would have done a desk job. I would have never got promoted. I couldn't deploy or any of that kind of stuff, and it wasn't what I joined for. So I made the, the decision to leave, and I had no clue what I could actually do as a civilian. So I did these two online interviews where you you feel a load of details to somebody and then they come back and they look at your cv and your skill set and your situation and they will recommend jobs for you that you could do as a civic the first one was a laborer on a building site <laughs> this, oh, is, this okay. is when i was in a, this is when i was in a wheelchair with one hand and i'm like Okay, so I'm like, I, I feel like a wheelbarrow assistant. You put me in a wheelbarrow and I just put blocks on my legs or something and yeah. someone pushes me and I was like, serious, I'll, I'll be dead within six months. And then the, the second one was very, very specific. They said, you know, as you're coming off the A38, driving into Plymouth and you look to the left and there's a Sainsbury's with the sails on the roof. I'm like, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. You should go and work there as a checkout assistant. And I, wow, that, I lost my temper specific. a little bit. They yeah, were that not, specific. Not... And I, I did lose my temper with them. And I'm like, surely there's a, and no disrespect at all to people that work as checkout assistants, not at all. But I'm just thinking, surely there's something where I can add more value to the world. You know, I've been a yeah. Royal Marines commander for 10 years. I've overcome these injuries. I did a few talks to that point, so I was was getting it on the circuit a little bit. You know what? There's got to be something else out there that I could do. But um, needless to say, I turned those droppers down. Yeah. And I was actually leaving. I left on the first of July, two thousand ten, and I was just about to do a charity event where we ran across America from New York to LA, three and a half thousand miles, me and a little team. And I got a call from a retired brigadier in the Marines that I hadn't met before, Brigadier Charlie Hobson. And he was the chief executive of what is now the Royal Marines Charity. And he introduced himself and he asked me if I wanted a job. So straight away I said, yes, sir. What do you want me to do? He went, no idea. We'll make something up. And they created a job for me. A Perfect. job that I did for 10 years. And it was great because I didn't have to leave the lads. It wasn't like I left the tour. It was like I went, I got promoted. Because now, guys were coming to me like a troop sergeant or a sergeant major for help and support and these kind of things. So I, I didn't, and to 20 years, I was still in that ecosystem as a 10 as a Marine, 10 as a civilian work with Marines. And it was great. It was brilliant. Um, Perfect. A great well, if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't mind me asking, right? So I, I'm always aware of taking up people's time, right? But what's the future hold for you? Because... If you don't mind, right, I, I have to throw this in, right? Uh, we share a common goal. I want to be 100 okay. years old. I want to be 100. I don't mind yeah. if it's 101 day old, but I want to be 100 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And I saw that in the interview and I was like, man. So what's the future hold for you, Mark? Um, so I 
after much going backwards and forwards in my mind, because I didn't think it was something, it wasn't really my world, I eventually got an agent um, for speaking, for TV work, uh, book deals and all this kind of stuff. So we're working on a lot of stuff in, in that world. A lot of collaborations with big brands. I've got a couple of books I want to write. Personal development is one of them. Um, we've got a movie being written in the background at the minute. I have just literally signed up for, uh, from the jiu-jitsu perspective, the Army Championships, the Reorg Open, the Devon Open, the Armed Service, the Armed Forces and Emergency Services Open, and that's all going to hopefully lead to Abu Dhabi at the end of the year. We're putting together a power team uh, led yeah, by awesome. Nigel. Nigel's yeah, leading yeah. it. Uh, I've seen, um, I said Nigel did it two years ago, I believe. I think that was the last time he did it, or maybe yeah. what, it might have been before COVID, actually. Yeah, and and compete, right? And compete, and and hopefully, fingers crossed, best case scenario, I'll come away as world champion at the end of the year. You you, you know, that, like you see, this is the thing. It's like when you graciously said you 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 come on the come on the show, like I was like, how do I do this? And like, you're you're actually um, an exception to the rule because there's not many people I. When it comes to research, nine times out of ten, I know most of them because I've been in martial mm. arts since I was 16, right? And then there's certain guys that, you know, they've got a high profile, so you go out there, you look at it, right? But it's it, it's quite bizarre because by listening to you, some of the stuff that you said really, really resonates with me. And like I said, I'm 54. And some of the realizations that you've talked about, I came I came to like a long time ago, yeah, you know, where you were saying about it's not the amount of people in your life, it's the quality of these people. Mm-hmm. Keep the circle small, only have positive influences in your life. Yeah, you know, don't be don't be going on social media and looking at the Kardashians when you can read a book. So it was mm-hmm. all of this stuff. But it was it like what got me was with you especially, it's like um yeah, if we use social media as an example. I always say the amount of people that have mental health issues, and I'm not knocking mental health issues because I, I've had crippling anxiety and it kills. But on Instagram, m- most mental health issues seem to be what we used to call a hangover. You know what I mean? Because they rock up on a Monday morning and they seem yeah. to dissipate by about Tuesday afternoon, right? But with you, well, I, I couldn't work out just to have the, it sounds cliche, but it's a sunny disposition. Everything that I've seen with you, you always sign off with how blessed you actually feel now. Mm. And as I said earlier in the interview, you, you've met, you've said it a few times where you said that all roads have led to where you are right now, mm. right? And it's like, how how can you have such a cheery disposition? Can you explain that to me? It takes time. I think it comes with age. I'm I'm very much into personal development, so it hasn't been easy in the early, like 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 everyone in life. I've had my pants pulled down, I've been ripped off, people have stolen money off me over the last couple of years. And what I want to do is go around to where they live with a sledgehammer, smash their front door in and tell them that that's naughty and they shouldn't have done it. But what I'll do instead is have faith that karma will come around and bite them in the ass. And as long as as long as I can go to bed at night, put my head on the pillow, and be a hundred percent legitimately happy that I do the right thing as much as I can, then I'm good to go. And all these bad experiences and these bad people, I just let the universe deal with them, and I just keep pushing forward. And even when people don't, I say this to my my children, and I, I've shown my wife in lots of examples there, people I've fallen out with over the years. They'll spend their energy on me, talking about me, trying to do where. And I, to me, it's just like nothing. It's done. Lines drawn. See ya. And I'm moving forward with my goals and my targets and what I want to do. And in a year's time, they're either still where they were or further back. And I'm 10 years ahead. So what's the, I don't waste my energy and my time on, on the negative crap. You know, I just, as quickly as possible, get out of my life and move on with what I want to do and what I want to achieve. Well, do you know what? Like you just said something there, and I'm going to wrap up. First of all, I'm going to thank you for giving us your time. Uh, trust me, uh, th- this has been a joy for me because, as I said, I've been watching your antics, and then uh, yeah, and just just the way you live your life, and then 
everybody that I know, like say Jimmy Johnson, uh, you know, Nathan is son, like Dexter now, the little lad, mm-hmm. he's now the Jim oh. Hammer, apparently. So he's Nathan's even telling me worse, he's, a, he's worse, he's a homicidal maniac, right? Yeah. So him and then Nigel Sempernus and dear friend Steve Reynolds, good, good, good friend of both mm-hmm. of ours, right? That they, they always say cool stuff about you, but you see, the one thing that got me. And it only happened last week. And it was that point where it was like, yeah, uh, there's a, there's an old saying, right? So Ernest Hemingway used to say, uh, people say that men shouldn't have heroes, right? But he said, as you get older, it's important that you have heroes, right? Mm-hmm. And the thing is, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I'm a hero, but what I'm saying is I'm pretty impressed in this because how many blokes can turn around and say their kid went to World Book Day Dressed as their <laughs> dad. Come on, man. Yeah. That, like, what happened cool. when you saw that? That's the bit we're going to finish up on. What was it like when you saw that? So I, I knew that she was going to do that. But the day of World Book Day, I was actually going out to Jersey to train with the guy that beat me in the competition. Uh, I spent a weekend training right. with him. And I, I got off the plane, landed in Jersey, and I put my, my Wi Fi back on. And it's this uh, WhatsApp came through. And I. I, I teared up a little bit because she'd put a beard on, my beret on. Yes. She had my book in her hand. She had uh, the the case for my MBE, and and all the local media were texting me and ringing me. And she became like famous locally overnight, which she she really loved. But yeah, I mean, yeah. of all the people she could have went as, all the characters or the real life people, she chose her dad, which was awesome. Mate, you see, as I said, that's the way we're, we're, like, we're going to wrap on that. But it was like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, not just as a martial artist, because as I said, you know, like Bradio Steamer turned around to me and he went, mate, he's good. Like, and the, and mm. the thing is with Bradio, Bradio is very, Bradio, Bradio will come out with lines like, oh, he's very strong. He's very fat. And you're like, as soon as he hears strong, you go, okay, so that's five minutes of absolute hell under this guy. Because he's not yeah. going to try, he's just going to try and basically batter me, right? Mm-hmm. But like I said, Bradio did it. And then when that came up, I looked at it and I was like, yeah, just not just a martial artist, but as a human being, yeah, come on, man. It doesn't get any better than that, bro. But right, thank you so right. much. I, I really appreciate, I said, I really appreciate your time, mate. And I wish you all the best for the future because obviously well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks man. for that, thank bro. You guys. Podcast Network.